Okay. As you know, we are studying the book of 2 Corinthians, and we've been doing that for a while. Uh, in fact, I think I've got a two and a half, so over 30 sermons now on, so far on the book of 2 Corinthians. And today we're going to be covering chapter 13. Chapter 13, which has 14 verses in it, and uh, this is the last chapter of the book of 2 Corinthians. So that means that you are here today at the finish of our study on the book of 2 Corinthians. And it's, uh, you know, it's a kind of a bittersweet moment for me. Um, uh, I have uh, been studying this book and sharing what I've learned, what God has given me on it for some time now. But uh, we're going to be finishing the book this morning. And I have a plan. The good news is I have a plan for what we are going to study next. But I'm not going to tell you now. So <laughs> you'll just have, to, just have to hang in there. You'll see soon enough. Let me ask you, do you remember why Paul wrote this letter? This is the, obviously we call it 2 Corinthians. We know it's at least fourth, the fourth letter he's written to the congregation at Corinth. But do you remember why Paul, I, it's a rhetorical question. I'm not asking you to raise your hand and start reciting this. But there were three reasons that, um, that I gave at the start of the study of the book. I just want to remind you of those. The first was the, uh, to correct misteachings that had happened in the congregation after Paul, who had founded the congregation in Corinth <clears throat> and had, had uh, taught there for a year and a half or so, and then he left to go on and uh, begin other congregations elsewhere, and he had a, a number of things to do. So um, he left the congregation in good hands, it seemed like, but when he left... Others came in behind him that I've referred to a number of times as infiltrators, but I hope you remember that uh, these actually were Jewish believers who were misteaching. And I think it wasn't that they were intentionally misteaching, I think, perhaps, but they did kind of get a, a feeling about themselves, a little higher feeling than they probably should have deserved, deserved because what they were teaching was just wrong. And that caused a lot of uh, confusion, as you might under, uh, expect in a congregation uh, there in Corinth. And as a result of the misteachings, some of the people were doubting, began to doubt Paul as the apostle, the one who started the congregation, and wondered if indeed he really was who he said he was. He claimed to be an apostle, but they saw Paul in a very weak situation. He was not very pushy about himself. He certainly didn't elevate himself. But the guys who came in after him, the infiltrators, sure did. And so there were questions about his spiritual authority in the congregation that developed. And I'm sure that caused division. So Paul uh, wrote the letter partly to uh, reestablish his uh, spiritual authority uh, at the congregation. And the third thing, he, the reason that he wrote the book was to get them on board again and remind them that he's coming there soon to collect the money. He's going to collect the money for the, the folks in Jerusalem who are going through a famine. You remember that? It wasn't the first time Paul collected money. He's done this before. But the people in, uh, in Jerusalem and uh, Israel uh, proper, remember he's far to the west of that. He's over in <clears throat> and uh, what the Galatian, that Turkey area, what we call t Turkey today, and that's where he was uh, working, and then over to Greece. Um, and so while he was there, there was a famine in Israel. And so in order to support the Jewish, you know, the home base congregation in Jerusalem, where James and, and the others were, uh, Peter and, and a lot of the pillars, you remember the pillars? That talked about the pillars of the country. They were in Jerusalem. Well, they were, they were struggling. It was hard to make ends meet in Jerusalem, especially if you were a believer. There were people in Israel who would not do business with you anymore because, as you know, they were rejected. Um, 
the believers were uh, from the community because of their faith in Yeshua. So anyway, he was collecting this. We call it the collection. It appears many times in this, in, uh, this book of 2 Corinthians. But he was coming, he's announcing to them that he's coming to them shortly. And part of the reason is to pick up their collection. And so he's telling them, get your, everybody needs to kind of make their contributions, the promises that they had made to contribute to this because I am coming to pick it up. And you can't mail it in later. All right. Throughout the letter, Paul had presented many arguments for each one of these items. However, this chapter is different. Because instead of arguments, he presents warnings as you will see when we go through this chapter, warnings about what is going to happen next. Before we do that, I'm going to ask you to please stand with me. We have a number of verses to go through, and I'd like to just uh, ask you to pray with me as we um, open up God's Word together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your Word, and I pray, Father, that as we... Uh, come to the very end of Paul's letter today that you would uh, help us to grasp the message that you have for us, which is an important one that Paul summarizes in this chapter, Lord God. Help us to be, uh, to, to be have, have teachable spirits that we might learn uh, what you want us to grasp from this book. Uh, we've been studying it for quite some time, Lord, and uh, we're, many things have been covered and we probably don't remember all the things, Lord God, but we pray that uh, to this very day, this very sermon right now, Lord, you would kind of pull it all together for us and we would uh, take away the message that you have for us. So please bless our time together now and may, it be, uh, may everything that I say come from you, not from me. And we thank you, Lord, for what you're about to do in Yeshua's precious name. Amen. You may be seated, provided... Wait a minute, uh, there's a provide. You can't be seated unless you promise you're not going to fall asleep. Because I have seen this. Uh, people get too comfortable, and it isn't my sermons. I'm determined. I, I know it isn't, because I've seen people fall asleep before I even start. <laughs> All right? So if, if, I, if I see you nodding off here, I'm going to ask somebody to tap you on the shoulder, or we're going to go, uh, Okay. And if you see somebody next to you who is uh, nodding off, please uh, just wake them up because you don't want them to miss this, okay? That's, that's my request. Okay, now we're going to cover uh, 14 verses here. Beginning in chap the, uh, chapter 13, verse 1, we read this text. This, Paul says, is the third time I am coming to visit you. Do you remember the other times that he, uh, that he came to visit him? Well... Back when he formed the congregation, back in the years 50 to 51 or so, when he, he came there for the first time and he formed his congregation on what was his second of how many missionary journeys did Paul have? How many? Three. Three? We hear three. We hear three. The right answer is four. The last one was in chains. Yeah, I know. It's a sneaky one. Ask your friends that. You can uh, tell them, you know, you can make a wager on that, the, the, the shekels thing. You know, tell them that they won't get it right. He really, okay, so he was on his second missionary journey, and Paul planted the congregation at that time and stayed for a year and a half building it. In the spring of 55, Paul had to make another quick trip, which he, wasn't, he didn't plan on doing. He was in Ephesus at the time. He had to come back. He was now on his third missionary journey. And he had to come back, and he had planted himself in Ephesus for like three years until he, had, uh, he got run out of Ephesus. You remember Demetrius the silversmith and all of that, right? So um, he was now back uh, in Ephesus, and at that time he heard about issues going on in the congregation in Corinth. And he decided, he sent people over, and they couldn't get it settled, so he decided to go himself. Unfortunately, even he could fix the, couldn't fix the problems. And so when he recognized that, he didn't want to stay and cause a real ruckus. He thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to withdraw from that right now, that the problems that are going on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back, and I'm going to pray about it, and I'm going to think about it. 
And that's what he did. And he left Ephesus rather quickly. In late 57 now, here we are. Paul finally is arriving again. Now, he's about to arrive. He hasn't arrived in, at this point in his letter. He has not yet gotten there. But that's when he will arrive to complete the three times that he, this will be the third time that he visited the congregation and the last that we know of. So, the rest of verse 1 in chapter 13 says this, after the third time coming to visit you, and as the scriptures say, the facts of every case must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. And you, if you pause for a moment and ask yourself, what, yeah, what's that got to do with the fact that this is your third trip over there? He's quoting the Deuteronomy chapter 19. It's in other places as well. But in Deuteronomy 19 verse 15, it says, A single witness shall not rise up against a man on account of any, any iniquity or any sin which he has committed. In other words, you can't accuse him if you only have one witness. It says, Only on the evidence of two or three witnesses shall a matter be confirmed. So what exactly, why is Paul, he says, we're coming here for the third time, and then he quotes this. What is he saying? Why, does he, why is he quoting this? He's through witnesses. He's coming for the third time, so what's going to do? You know what? Scholars, quote unquote, disagree on this one. It seems like, to me, he's talking about a third visit being a third witness. I don't know. Some scholars believe that. Others believe, no, no, it has nothing to do with that. It's just coincidental that it's a third visit. I have no idea exactly why he's doing that, why he's saying that. But he reminds us that of that fact right after he says, this is the third time I'm coming, so I'm, I'm guessing it's connected. He goes on in verse 2 to say, I have already warned those who have been sinning when I was there on my second visit, remember the one, the quick one, now I warn them and all others, just as I did before, that the next time I come, I will not spare them. You know what? This is going to be different than the previous visits. I've labeled this sermon... Here comes the judge, because I really think Paul is taking a new, he's been, remember, he prayed about this. Maybe God said, you know what, Paul? You've been very kind and very gentle. It may be time to be a little stronger in correcting what's going on at the, at the congregation in Corinth. I have a feeling this was God, the Lord that inspired him. He doesn't say what kind of punishment. He says, I will not spare them. What's he going to do? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is he's going to verbally stand them up, the ones who are and in front of others, and tear them apart verbally. Something he has not done before. You didn't think Paul had, him, had that in him. Guess what? Think again. Might he simply, if these people refuse to change and correct their ways, might he tell them, you see that door? Time to exit the congregation. Now, today, if somebody throws you out of a congregation, what do you do? You go down the street practically, get in your car, and you find another one. They're all over the place. I mean, Messianic congregation, not so much. But certainly in churches, if you have a problem with what's going on in one church, out the door. Go. You don't even have to be asked. I don't like this church. I don't like the color of the, of the choir robes or something, you know. So I'm leaving here. Uh, leaving a congregation in those days was much more serious. They were not just down the street. So if you were asked and dis thrown out of a congregation... It was serious business. You did not just walk down the street. Was he going to bring a sickness on those who were refusing to change? Did he want to get their attentions? Would Paul do that kind of thing? Huh? How about this? You remember Elimus? 
when he was in Cyprus, who was pressing in on him and following Paul around Cyprus when he was trying to, uh, to share the, the gospel with the leaders down there in, on the, the island of Cyprus. And he, and he came and he was, he was ministering and he, uh, talking and, and, and sharing the gospel with the leader, one of the, one of the mockers. You know what a mocker is? It's a Yiddish term for a bigwig. And he, he was talking with him. And here is this Elimus who was causing a lot of problems and keeps interrupting. He was a sorcerer, this Elimus was, a magician of sorts, which is really not viewed very well in Scripture. And so at one point, t Paul turned to him and, and called God down to blind him. Paul knows what blinding is all about. It was a temporary thing. And so Elimus was blinded for a while. Paul could do that kind of thing. I've never tried it. <laughs> but if you fall asleep, I might think about it. <laughs> All right. The rest of the verse, uh, chapter, th uh, verse 3, beginning verse, uh, first part of verse 3 says, I will give you, and by the way, you see I'm using the NLT 2, the New Living Translation, second edition, because it's easy to understand. I will give you all the proof you want that Messiah speaks through me. Uh-oh. Just in case you had any doubts, I am going to give you plenty of evidence that the Messiah speaks through me. Back just one chapter earlier, you may remember or may not, in chapter 12, we read this text. Paul said, when I was with you, I certainly gave you proof that I'm an apostle. This is probably referring to the time he planted the congregation, not the the second time, but the first time he was there for a year and a half. When I was with you, I certainly gave you proof that I was an apostle. I didn't just tell you, trust me. For I patiently, over time, did many signs and wonders and miracles among you. All right, I'm not, I haven't done many signs and miracles, right? So I guess if I tell you I'm an apostle, you shouldn't believe me. I have no evidence to that point. But Paul was. And apparently, he did enough to prove it the first time. Absolute proofs of the apostleship. Now, again, does he have to do this again? Did they forget what he did when he was there a few years ago? How quickly they forget. You know what? This is very contemporary. Apologize for this, maybe. Well, maybe I don't. This is an insult to Paul. And you know what Paul said? Sorry, no do-overs. Anybody listening to the news? Huh. Somebody else just said that very thing. I, I can't, you know, sometimes things just hit you. Some things change, and some things in life don't change. Over centuries and in, in millennia, people are still people. No do-overs this time, Paul says. Not, I'm, not, I'm not coming with uh, signs, wonders, and miracles this time. He goes on to say, in the, first, in the second part of verse 3, Messiah is not weak when he deals with you. He is powerful within you. He lives inside of you. Does he not? He's not weak. He's not weak now. Messiah has really never been weak. Although some people will look at that and say, oh, yes, he was. Come on. He was crucified. Gee whiz. Of course, he said, I could call an army of angels down, but uh, I'm not going to do that. Remember, remember, when he went to the cross, he did it willingly. And this is one of my favorite, I'm, I'm going to share with you one of my favorite quotes of all time in the text. 
in John 10, chapter 18, no one can take my life from me, he said, Yeshua said. I sacrifice it voluntarily. For I have the authority to lay it down whenever I want to. And this part ought to really grasp you. The next phrase. Also, to take it up again. Just think about that. While the body is dead, he has the power in himself still to resurrect it. This guy don't kid around. Verse 4, although he was crucified in weakness, people would look at it that way. Come down, if you're the Messiah, come down from that cross, remember? And what did he say? He stayed there. That was harder than to come down. Although he was crucified in apparent weakness, I put that in quotes. That's not in the text in quotes. It should be. They didn't have quotes. I'm just saying. Although he was crucified in weakness, he now lives by the power of God. That's Paul talking to the Corinthians. We too are weak, quote unquote, just as Messiah was. But when we deal with you, we will be alive with him and we will have God's power, which is uh, pretty awesome. So, all of you who are here, who believe in him, he says, we too are weak, quote unquote. Not really. Not really. You, if you have the Lord living within you, you are not a weak person. Think about that for a moment. Maybe you see yourself as weak. Maybe you're aging, and you're finding your body is getting older and weaker. So you might, others might think of you as weak, but you know what? In God's sight, because of who dwells within you, you are not weak. You are not weak. Here comes the judge, just a reminder. Examine yourself, Paul says to the Corinthians. Examine yourselves to see if your faith is genuine. Test yourselves. Have you ever thought about doing that? Have you ever wondered about your own faith? Do, do I believe enough? Is my faith strong enough? Do I, I mean, because I, I, occasionally, occasionally I act like I, I'm a little unsure of myself, and there are times where I can identify with Thomas, doubting Thomas, who said, Lord, I believe, cure thou my unbelief. What does that say? You know what? I'm, I'm going to guess that a lot of you have experienced moments in your life where you wonder about whether God is really hearing your prayers, or if he's really there. You have your doubts. Do I believe strong enough? I'm, when I appear before the Lord, is he going to say, you know what? You didn't really do what you could have done. And what are you going to say then? Oh, but, 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 Lord, I didn't know I had this power in me. I really didn't. I wasn't sure. I didn't, you know. Next time, I'll do it. No, there is no next time. So here he says, find out. Okay, I'm going to give everybody, would you like me to do this? I'll give you a test this morning. I am going to put you guys right here to the test. Now, you didn't study for this test, did you? We're going to take a test this morning. You see, the Corinthians were demanding Paul prove again that he was an apostle. Paul is now turning the table on them. He says, no do-overs? Not only no do-overs, I'm going to put you guys 
to the test to see if your faith is genuine. Uh Uh-oh, uh-oh. That's a little scary. I'd I'd be worried if I were sitting in the seats now, right now, and Paul's standing in front of me saying, I'm putting you to the test. I don't know if I studied uh, last night. I didn't say my prayer. It's the morning. I was in a rush. Uh, What test is Paul going to give them? What are they going to take? Did you think there was a test in chapter 13 of 2 Corinthians? Here it is. Surely you know that Messiah Yeshua is within you. If not, you have failed the test of genuine faith. It's interesting. This was a one question take home test, I call it. Go home and think about this. Is the Messiah in you or not? If you've placed your faith in him, do you think he's rejected you? Or do you have confidence that he is with you? And he's not leaving you. So you ask yourself this question. Do you feel like you have a relationship with the Lord? Do you feel in your heart of hearts that he's present within you and you know him? Verse 6 says, as you test yourselves, I hope you will recognize another thing that we have not failed, we, the apostle here, he's speaking uh, generically here, that we have not failed the test of apostolic authority. Basically, Paul's saying, once you recognize who you are, I hope you recognize then who I am. So the take-home test is going to confirm two things. First of all, that you know Messiah, And beyond that, that Paul is indeed one of God's apostles. Now, you and I here, with the benefit of Paul's writings, which they probably didn't have in Corinth, had some of it. Who knows what he left? He was there for a year and a half. I hope the people who were there when he was teaching to them took some notes. Maybe they recorded it. No, they couldn't have done that but they listened carefully. I wonder what attendance was like in that congregation when Paul was there for a year and a half. You say, I I mean, put yourself back there. Now, you and I know, would you you go and get in your car or or get a ride somewhere, wherever you need to, to go hear Paul if if you knew he was going to be speaking somewhere? Would Would you do that? How did the people feel about listening to him? He was there for a year and a half. Maybe they wanted a day off. Maybe he was going to be speaking on Shabbat. Maybe other times. Maybe he had a uh, a Chavara group in his house or his tent or wherever he was staying in Corinth. I wonder how many times people got to sit in the presence of Paul. They should have known who he was. Verse 7, we pray to God, Paul writes, that you will not do what is wrong by refusing our correction. You got problems, I'm going I'm to correct them. I hope we won't need to demonstrate our authority when we arrive. Do the right thing before we come, he says. Even if, even if that makes it look like we, the apostles and entourage that are coming, have failed to demonstrate our authority. In other words, we don't need to do it because you've changed and and corrected your ways before we even got there. And so, who gets the credit? 
Who gets the credit for changing? For we, he says, remember, we cannot oppose the truth. We must always stand for the truth. That's what we're all about. We're glad to seem weak to others if it helps show that you are actually strong. And we pray that you will become mature, that I won't have to come and correct you. I, I would like to come there after you've gotten it right so that you get the credit, not us, Paul says. That's what he wants. He doesn't want to have to come and correct the people. He wants it. Listen up. I'm coming, but you can fix it before I even get there. I don't want to have to make a scene when I come. But you know what? I will if I have to. Verse 10. I am writing this letter to you before I come, hoping that I won't need to deal severely with you when I do come. For I want to use the authority that the Lord has given me to strengthen you, to encourage you, to build you up, not to tear you down. You know, if you knew the heart of Paul, who has enormous power, capability to do things, and we have a history, a remarkable number of miracles that we know of that Paul did. Blinding Elimus was just a minor thing. I gave you a list of some of the things that uh, the Scripture tells us, some of the, the miracles that uh, Paul did. He, can, he wants, his heart is not to make a scene, is to strengthen the people, to encourage them. He doesn't want them to fear his coming. Some might. Gosh, I have to be careful here because I can jump into the news too quickly. His desire is to help people strengthen their faith. He doesn't want to tear them down. He doesn't want to do something to them that's going to cause them to you know, be embarrassed or worse yet. In Acts 20, this is a fascinating little sidelight here, but it, has, it plays into what we're doing. In Acts 20, verse 3, it says that Paul stayed on this trip, this third missionary journey, he stayed three months in Greece. Now, including, remember, when he came to Greece, he was in the northern Greece in Macedonia, and there is where he wrote this letter, which we call 2 Corinthians. So he stayed there for three months. It's likely that he didn't spend a whole lot of time in Macedonia, but that he spent most of it down in Corinth. While he was there, he zipped off a little short note that we call the book of Romans. Not exactly a short note. <laughs> Who knows how many other things he wrote? I wish I had some. Good thing we don't know what other things he wrote because we'd really feel bad that we lost them. I think Paul may have written hundreds of letters. We have 13. Glad it's not fewer than that. What about the other uh, 356 that he wrote? But it's likely that Paul spent most of the time there because uh, in Corinth when he made this trip because uh, that's where he wrote the book of Romans as well as taught the, uh, the, the, uh, the people in Corinth. But at the, we know that from other from other writings, not from, the, not from the Scripture. At the end of the first century, remember, this is like the middle of the first century. We're talking 50, 50 C. So about 50 years later, somebody named Clement, he was the leader of the congregations in Rome. He wrote to the Corinthians back in Greece, Clement did, praising the work that Paul did when he, Paul, was there and worked like he is now in this scenario that he's writing 2 Corinthians. So Clement wrote back to the group that was still at Corinth. This is 50 years later. 50 years after Paul was there for his last time. It's likely that Clement would never have praised Paul to the Corinthians 
if, if Paul's, Paul and his writings were not held in high honor by the Corinthians. They wouldn't have brought that up. If he was in dishonor, probably Clement wouldn't have praised Paul to them. Based on just that note from Clement, we may conclude, and the fact that this is 50 years later, he's writing to a congregation that was on the edge there, didn't dissolve. We may conclude based on that point alone that uh, Paul's efforts were indeed very successful in Corinth so that he was able to do the thing he wanted to do, strengthen them and not tear down the Corinthians when he got there. That's a, that's a little side note here because I worried about this myself. I thought to myself, here we have studied this note. Here Paul is saying, all these things you're doing wrong, let me correct you in this, and by the way, you, you, you know, all this. And, and you wonder, he wrote this letter we call Second Corinthians. Did it work? Did his visit work after he went down? Maybe he had to go down and tear him up. Did that work? You know what? There's just a little bit of history like this. It gives us a little clue about what happened that's not in Scripture. That, current, that congregation was probably still there. It's probably not. Did you visit? You didn't visit Corinth yet on this last trip, did you? Next one, Debbie. It's, it's kind of interesting because you read the letter. You read the points that he brought up with me as we've been going through over 30 sermons now on the book of uh, Second Corinthians. And how many things that he said really hit pay dirt in the hearts and minds of the people? How many of them? Did some of them, did some of them touch you? They did me. I always say that if you really want to learn about the Bible, commit yourself to teaching it. Make sure you do your homework. Because you always learn so much more than you can share. So if you're not leading a Bible study and you think you could, in fact, it's been playing on you for a while, I suggest Talbot's right up in La Mirada. Prepare yourself and then come to me and say, I'm ready to teach. Good. Yeshua didn't launch the disciples into touring Israel two days after they came to him. No, they spent over three years with him uh, that we know of. They first had to do their homework with, with uh, the master. Then he sent them out. If you want to teach, you really need to know what you're talking about. And you can if you're serious about it. And the one who will be most blessed will be you. I'm coming to strengthen you, not to tear you down. You know, we have four more verses here. But these four verses are Paul's closing remarks to the Corinthian congregation. In a sense, they, they kind of, Paul has stepped out of the threat, the warnings that he was just giving them, and now he shares his heart about having to even end the letter. I hope these four verses touch you as much as they did me. Finally, dear brothers and sisters, I close my letter with these last words. First of all, be joyful. It's easy when we're in the midst of the tourists of our lives, to lose sight of the joy, the reasons for joy. Maybe you've got problems physically, friendship, parents, sisters, brothers, children. You might have a lot of tourists in your life, your own job situation, your spouse. That's the one hopefully sitting next to you, but... Um, be joyful. Rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. Paul wrote half a dozen years or so later after he wrote this, uh, this letter. In Philippians, he wrote rejoice. Philippians 4. <laughs> rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. 
Be joyful. This morning, as you're sitting here, I'm talking to each and every one of you. Smile. God has good things ahead for you. You can smile. Whatever is troubling you, the issues and so on, those will disappear when you get to see him in person. Don't forget that. Be joyful. Take the, keep the long view in mind. And as you do that, allow God to grow you and challenge you. He's working in your life. And maybe it's through difficulty. No pain, no gain. Right? Maybe going through some stuff right now. And maybe it'll go through more stuff tomorrow. It may be in a parking lot here. I don't know what God has ahead for you. But he's not done with you. That's why you're still here. <laughs> That's why I'm still here too. I guess he's not done with me. <laughs> Grow to maturity. The first two of the things that he says to do here deal with the individuals. But the next two deal with relationships. He says, encourage one another. Encourage the people that you know in this congregation and other believers. Encourage them. Take, take time to, to write a note, to, pay, to you know, make a phone call. We have people on our, you know, on our uh, email prayer chain, we call it, on our email prayer list, where people can be made aware of difficulties. Because, you know, the prayers are rarely praised, but sometimes they are, and they are. Belinda's leading that, and she's making, she visits people who are sometimes in need of a uh, little encouragement. God bless her. And you know what she says about doing that? She says, I hate it. No, she says, I love to do it. I love to do it. This is, this is a gift. That lady has a gift. Amen. She goes into hospitals and places where people are hurting, and she just spends time with them. I think the Lord smiles on that. Encourage each other. Pick up a phone and call someone who you think might need. Just a phone call. Just a few, few moments. It won't take long. It doesn't have to be a long call. Live in harmony and peace. Then, if you do that, if you seek harmony and peace then the God of love and peace will be with you. How about that for a thought? This is a challenge. Greet each other with a holy kiss. Anybody here want a holy kiss? The operative word is holy. Yeah, the operative word is holy. Right. This, by the way, this, this instruction appears no fewer than five times in the Brit Kaddisha. Basically, it talks about a, a, a loving kiss or a holy kiss. Now, I'm not sure that I really want you to lean over to everybody and start kissing them. <laughs> Scholars have been working on this one. What did Paul mean with a holy kiss? A holy hug might be pretty good. But be careful on that one, too. <laughs> but maybe he's really saying, show your affection, your appreciation to somebody else. But do it respectfully. I don't want us to get arrested. <laughs> Greet each other with affection. These are your brothers and sisters in the Lord. All of God's people... Paul says here, and he's talking in Macedonia, send you their greetings. How sweet is that? Somebody who's off somewhere else, far away from a congregation, is writing to this congregation and saying, you know what? Everybody here, this whole group of folks that are all believers and brothers and sisters in the Lord, they send their greetings to you. You have not been forgotten. Now, I think in those days, since they didn't get a whole lot of letters, how many of you get emails? How many of you get too many emails? 
Yeah, I'm right. They didn't have that then. If they got a letter, can you imagine going to the congregation? Maybe on a Shabbat morning, maybe it was a home group, maybe it was who knows where they were meeting, and somebody stands up and said, look at this, look at this. I got a letter today from Paul. What would you say? Read it. <laughs> Please, let's hear what he said. Everybody in the congregations he was at in Macedonia were sending you their greetings. They may not even know you by name. Maybe they do. Maybe you know some of them and they do. But, you know, travel was a little hard there in those days. The, the whole congregation sends you their greetings. And then he closes with this. Three things. Three things. First of all, may the grace of the Lord Messiah Yeshua. What is grace? Unmerited favor. You don't deserve it, but I'm going to be nice to you anyway. That's what grace is. It doesn't say, what have you done for me? Oh, well, you haven't been nice to me, so heck with you. You parked in my spot this morning. I'm taking the last bagel. I'm sorry. Grace. We should be characterized by that because every one of us messes up now and then. Some more than other, others. Grace. It's a gift that could keep on giving. Try it sometime. May the grace of the Lord Messiah show you. This is the guy, remember, who went to the cross and gave his life for you. Did you deserve it? How many people feel they deserved it? You were worthy of it. No, not too many hands. While you were yet a sinner, maybe thumbing your nose at him, certainly going about your own business, he died for you. That's how much love he has. May that grace show through you sometime. And may the love of God that you have in your heart and God has for you, may that kind of love show through you. And lastly, you see a pattern here? And the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. That is one of the most beautiful verses in all of Scripture. Guess what? Paul has just pointed again to the triune God. The grace of the Lord Messiah, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. He's mentioned all of them in one sense right here. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for encouraging us today. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, uh, we need you. We need you even more than we have you now in our hearts and, and our lives. Help us, Lord. Help us draw close to you. Help us, help us to be gracious to others. Help us to be filled with, with, with the love that you have for us. And Lord, may your spirit be welcome here in our midst and everywhere we go. Lord, thank you for this, preserving this letter from a man you chose to represent you on this planet. Thank you for preserving it. Thank you for helping us to, to be able to read it and understand even parts of it. What a gift it is. Thank you for challenging us to do more than we're doing in ways that are better than we're doing. Lord God, I, I just lift up each and every person here right now to you. And I pray, Lord, you would anoint them with uh, the wisdom to use the time they have left in their lives. Some of it's going to be, I don't know, decades. Use that time wisely. Help, help them, Lord, to do that. Watch over them, Lord. Protect them. Guide them. Give them encouragement when they need it. 
and help them, Lord, to remember to encourage others. Help us, Lord, to represent you faithfully here on earth. May we do that right here at Ben David. Maybe in our families. May we just be joyful at what lies ahead of us, and may it overflow to those around us. Thank you for this time and this letter, Lord God. We look forward to hearing and learning even more from you in the days, weeks, and years ahead. And we give you all the praise and all the glory. B'Shem Yeshua, Mishikenu, in the name of Yeshua, our Messiah. Amen. Let's stand and close with a song.